I'm going to take you to the very, very opposite end of um, HIV research from where David took you on implementation and very large-scale studies and talk about our work towards an HIV cure. In my talk, I'm going to focus primarily on the major scientific barriers to a cure. And in the talk following me, Jintana and Anna Waranich will focus on clinical trials and strategies being tested. So I think everyone in the room knows that there is only one case of HIV cure. Um, Timothy Brown, who received a bone marrow transplant from a donor who was naturally resistant to HIV because they were homozygous for CCR5. This has been attempted six further times now and no individual has yet been cured in the same way that Timothy Brown has been cured. So we know that a true cure or total elimination of HIV is going to be pretty tough. So what I'm going to talk about is why it's so difficult and what those major barriers are. And the first is HIV persistence, um, and I'm going to talk specifically around HIV latency, new insights into how it's established, maintained, and reversed. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about HIV persistence in tissues, because this is a new area that I think is throwing up some additional challenges. Cure doesn't just rely on eliminating persistent HIV. We also need to correct impaired immune function that persists in people on antiretroviral therapy. And I'll talk about some strategies around boosting HIV-specific T cell function and reducing inflammation. And finally, I think one of the major barriers that still persists is the ability to measure viral persistence in order to support our clinical trials, and particularly finding a biomarker of functional cure. So I like this classification uh, put forward by Ti Wook Chun and Tony Fauci, which summarizes how HIV persists on antiretroviral therapy. And the main take-home message here is that it persists in lots of different ways, and you can think about it in lots of different um, categories. But I like this one because it's really shows you the complexity of HIV persistence. You can think about persistence in the context of different body compartments. You can think about it in terms of different cell types, the status of the virus, and the status of infected cells. So we know that amongst cell types, HIV can persist in all different T cell subsets, some that are long-lived, such as central memory and naive and stem cell T cells, and others that are short-lived, such as effector memory and transitional memory T cells. And HIV can also persist in monocytes and macrophages, though this is slightly more controversial than our understanding of HIV in T cells. We know that HIV can also persist in blood, in the, gastro, in the um, gut associated lymphoid tissue, in, lymph, in uh, peripheral lymphoid tissue, in the brain and other tissue compartments. And the mechanism for persistence there are all quite different. I'll talk about those. The virus can be replication defective or it can be replication competent. And it's really replication competent virus we're most concerned about. And finally, virus can persist in both quiescent and activated T cells. Now, HIV latency really largely addressed persistence in resting T cells and in long-lived T cells. So I'm going to talk a little bit about HIV latency, how it's established, maintained, and new approaches to reversing latency. So HIV latency can be established in two ways. HIV, as many of you know, predominantly infects activated CD4 T cells, once infected, the productively infected T cell produces lots of virions and then usually dies. However, a small number of cells can survive and revert to a memory state and carry an integrated provirus. And this is commonly referred to as post-activation latency. It's now well accepted that HIV can establish latency through a totally different pathway by directly infecting a resting CD4 T cell, usually in the context of an additional stimulus like chemokines or co-culture or, or contact with dendritic cells or other antigen-presenting cells. And this is commonly referred to as pre-activation latency. And this really guides the development of in vitro models for latency, 
the relative contribution of pre-activation and post-activation latency in vivo is currently not really well understood, but it's likely that we will need different strategies to eliminate these different forms of latency. Now, once the virus is integrated into a resting T cell, there are a whole lot of different mechanisms that effectively silence the virus or maintain latency. The first is the integration site is really important. This can be important in whether the, the cell can proliferate in the presence of an integrated provirus. It's important for the control of virus expression through acetylation or methylation. We know that in a resting T cell, transcription is also very inefficient, again largely driven by whether the virus is in a region of the chromatin that is at, based on its acetylation and methylation status. Tra in a resting T cell, there's also a reduction in the transcription factors that are needed to activate efficient virus production. And this is also controlled by the activation state of the cell. I've shown here two molecules, PD-1 and CTLA-4. They're both immune checkpoint markers or they reduce the level of T cell activation and now are also a target for latency reversal. In addition to these factors that all silence transcription, we know that there's inefficient export of HIV RNA into the cytoplasm. There are blocks to translation through host microRNAs. And this results in reduction of HIV proteins like TAT and REV that are needed for viral production. So you can see that there are multiple steps along this post-integration pathways that all enhance latency, and they're all also potential targets for interventions to reverse latency. So the first um, uh, approaches that have been used to try and eliminate latency are what's called shock and kill. I think many of you would be familiar with this, where a resting cell containing an integrated provirus is shocked or stimulated to produce viral RNA, viral proteins or virions with the goal that this will trigger or eliminate the latently infected cell. The first drugs that went into clinical trials to test this hypothesis were HDAC inhibitors, histone deacetylase inhibitors, and what these drugs do is they increase acetylation and therefore increase the efficiency of viral transcription. This summarises the uh, five clinical trials that have been performed with HDAC inhibitors using the HDAC inhibitors varinostat, panabinostat and romidepsin. And the results were largely consistent, meaning that all of the drugs activated virus transcription. Some drugs also acted viral production, that was romidepsin, but none of the drugs eliminated the number of latently infected cells, so HIV DNA didn't change at all. And there have been subsequently further tr studies now using interventions that are not HDAC inhibitors. Disulfiram, a study that we performed that activates a pathway or increases transcription factors. And then more recently, Briostatin, a study performed in Spain. And again, uh, disulfiram showed similar results, increasing transcription, no change in lately infected cells. So the challenge we have here are, first of all, to increase the potency of activation. Can we activate more virus than we're currently doing? And the kill, can we increase the number of cells that die? So far, none of these latency reversing agents have eliminated the number of infected cells. So one of the strategies being uh, explored quite extensively is using a combination of latency reversing agents to boost transcription. And many of these approaches are doing, uh, are looking at combinations with the backbone of an HDAC inhibitor. And the reason why this is being done is because it's thought that HDAC inhibitors basically get the process going. It Un they unravel the chromatin to allow the initial steps of transcription. And then if you could combine that with a drug that then boosts the transcription factors you need to make new virus, you could potentially increase potency. And multiple combinations have been tested in vitro. All of the ones listed here show some synergism, at least in vitro. So HDAC inhibitors with another epigenetic modifying drug 
methylation inhibitors or methyl transferase inhibitors, HJAC inhibitors with bryostatin, HJAC inhibitors with disulfiram, and HJAC inhibitors with IL-15 are all combinations that show synergism in vitro. And it's interesting to note that Merck, who have a very active program of identifying new and novel latency reversing agents, do their screening in the background of an HJAC inhibitor to find new compounds. Now, moving these combinations into clinical trials has not yet happened. It will be challenging because you'll have the combination of toxicity, but there are now plans for some of these combinations to move forward into early phase one, two clinical trials. The other really important aspect of trying to eliminate latency is to boost the kill, because as I said earlier, none of these drugs so far can eliminate um, latently infected T cells. And there's two main ways that you could do this. One is by enhancing immune-mediated killing, largely by combining a latency-reversing agent with a vaccine. And Jintana will talk more about this, because these studies are already um, underway. And the other approach is one that's really new and one that um, hasn't yet at all got near the clinic, and that is combining a latency-reversing agent with a drug that enhances cell death or enhances apoptosis. And there are lots of these drugs around because they're largely used for the treatment of malignancy when they block um, uh, pathways to trigger death of a malignant cell. So um, drugs that enhance apoptosis like BCL2 antagonists, PR3K antagonists. And I want to talk about one interesting uh, recent study that um, demonstrates this principle. It's a bit complex, so I'll just take you through this. So HIV protease doesn't just cleave HIV proteins, it can cleave procaspase 8 to another, to a byproduct, which is very important in either tr um, leading the cell to survive or leading the cell to die. So you can see here in an HIV-infected individuals, there's an increase in this protein, a product of caspase 8, um, shown here. It's largely seen in central memory and effector memory T cells, not seen in CD3 negative cells. So what um, Andrew Badley's group here did was looked at the effect of combining a stimulation for HIV production with a drug that blocked BCL2, which is important for cell survival. And he used a drug called the Venetoclax, a BCL2 antagonist. This drug was least, at least recently reported in the New England Journal of Medicine to be uh, very um, uh, beneficial in the setting of uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and showed in vitro that you dramatically reduce the number of infected cells, which was just in HIV-infected cells. So this could be a very interesting new agent to trigger apoptosis in combination with a latency-reversing agent. Now, what about HIV persistence in tissue? This throws up a whole lot of other new challenges. And we know that HIV can persist in a range of anatomical reservoirs, in the brain, in the gastrointestinal tract, in the lymphoid tissue, and the genitourinary tract. And recently, there's been a lot of interest in what is going on in lymph node in individuals on antiretroviral therapy. And one of the first papers to study this in detail came from Lewis Picker, who looked at um, lymph nodes in SIV-infected macaques on antiretroviral therapy. And what he showed was that in, in macaques on treatment, there was this very protected area of the lymph node inside what's called the B-cell follicle. And this is shown very nicely here by a schematic from Jeff Lipson, where a B-cell follicle is basically a protected area of the lymph node because it blocks cytotoxic T cells from coming in. And they showed in these SRV-infected macaques that there was a high concentration of virus in these follicles in a specific cell called a T follicular helper cell, and that these persisted in, in, in SRV-infected in macaques on antiretroviral therapy. This has been um, confirmed now in human studies. This work comes from Giuseppe Pantaleo, who looked at T follicular helper cells, which you can define by expression of particular markers, CX, CR5, and PD1. And he compared replication competent virus between blood and lymph node um, in, uh, in non T follicular helper cells or T follicular helper cells here. And you could see this in significant enrichment 
of replication competent virus in the T follicular helper cells in lymph node. In a cross-sectional analysis, he looked at this virus, it's shown here in blue squares, virus in PD-1 high cells, and showed the longer you were on treatment, there was this um, apparent decay, this is a cross-sectional study, I should add, in this virus in T follicular helper cells. So this may be a reservoir that actually decays. Now in gastrointestinal tract, the environment's very different. We recently published um, that HIV is enriched in a subset of T cells that express the chemokine receptors CCR6 and CXCR3. These are commonly also known as TH1 and TH17 cells, but a log higher virus in cells that express those chemokine receptors compared to those that don't. And these cells are highly enriched in rectum. Over about 80% of cells in the rectum are actually cells that express CCR6. So this could be another potential target to look at in rectal tissue. Finally, in brain, the cells that are thought to be of mo the main culprit are monocytes or macrophages. This work comes from Melissa Churchill, who was able to study brains from HIV-infected individuals who died on antiretroviral therapy. And she used a very nice technique called laser capture microscopy, which means she could label the cells of interest, here the microglia, then remove those by a very fine uh, level microscopy and then look if those cells were infected. Now these studies are very hard to do, given access to this sort of tissue is very, very difficult. She looked in five individuals and found HIV DNA detected in microglia in only one of the five individuals. And we, when you looked at the sequence of that virus um, shown highlighted in blue, this looked quite different to the sequence that she identified from the peripheral blood. So I think, although it's still controversial about whether macrophages form a true reservoir, microglia can be infected and they are quite different to the infection that persists in blood. Finally, does replication still persist on antiretroviral therapy? This still is quite controversial. Early this year, there was a paper in Nature arguing that persistent replication exists and this exists in lymph node tissue. The study was only performed on three individuals and after six months of treatment, which may not be enough to let decay of replication competent virus occur. They used a technique where they compared sequences in the lymph node to blood to plasma and show that the lymph node sequences evolve at a different rate. So what are some of the interventions that we could now use to target tissue? Most of these are, are really happening in monkey models, not in clinical trials yet. So in the lymph node, one strategy would be to disrupt this B cell follicle, and this could be possible with anti-CD20, or enhance migration of T cytotoxic T cells into the follicle with chemokines such as CX CL13. Specific agents that could target the gastrointestinal tract could block trafficking of these cells into gut using chemokine antagonists or antagonists of integrins that guide T cells into gut. In the CNS, most approaches are still largely looking at turning, on residual vir turning off residual viral replication by using agents that have enhanced uptake in the CNS, and there's currently a study of intensification with dolutegravir and miraviroc, looking at this very question. And maybe residual virus replication um, can be altered by using drugs that have enhanced tissue uptake. And um, that's been shown previously for raltegravir, and we're currently doing a study looking at dolutegravir. And I think it's interesting to think of what TAF might do, given David showed earlier, five times the level of concentration of drug inside cells compared to tenofovir. What about um, impaired um, immune function on antiretroviral therapy and how can this be addressed? Well, we know that there is impaired immune function on um, antiretroviral therapy. There are multiple immune escape mutations within the reservoir that persist, and we know that those T cells from people on antiretroviral therapy have impaired killing. Probably the best and most direct evidence that T cell function is important in maintaining virus suppression, even on antiretroviral therapy, comes from this work looking at CD8 T cell depletion in macaques done by Guido Silvestri. So this is an example of the monkeys that Guido studied. They were treated with antiretroviral therapy. 
and after maintaining viral suppression, CD8 T cells were depleted using an antibody to CD8. And you can see after giving the antibody, the number of CD8 T cells shown here in black decreased dramatically, and at the same time there was this um, low level but clear rebound in virus in plasma. When looking across the 11 animals studied, you can see here viral um, H SIV RNA in plasma before the depletion, after the depletion, and after CD8 T cell reconstitution. And you can show very clearly here that those CD8 T cells were indeed doing something even on animals on antiretroviral therapy. So how could we boost um, CD8 T cell function to make it even more efficient? One approach is to take advantage of these dramatic improvements in cancer immunotherapy that many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with, uh, boost, using agents to boost T cell function to enhance clearance of cancer antigens is really very relevant to what we might do to enhance clearance of HIV-infected T cells. So for those unfamiliar with this um, area of research, exhausted T cells express a range of different molecules, often called immune checkpoint markers. Here's an example of one immune checkpoint marker, PD-1, marks an exhausted T cell. When PD-1 binds its ligand, PD-L1, expressed here on an antigen presenting cell, the T cell loses function or becomes exhausted. By interfering with that interaction with an antibody to either PD-1 or PD-L1, you can boost activity or reinvigorate the T cell to now have cytotoxic activity against either a cancer antigen or an HIV antigen. And there's a whole range of different immune checkpoint markers now under active development by many, many companies all around boosting T cell function in cancer. But we've known for many years that ex vivo, if you block PD-1 or PD-L1 or other immune checkpoint markers like CTLA-4 and TIGET is another one, you can enhance HIV-specific T cell function. And Jintano will talk a little bit about some of the clinical trials that are happening with these agents. Um, immune checkpoint markers also identify latently infected cells. So this work from Nicolas Chamon shows that in PD-1 high cells, there's enrichment for HIV compared to PD-1 low cells. And if you look at some of these other immune checkpoint markers here, PD-1, TIGET, and two other ones, LAG3 or CTLA-4, the more of these immune checkpoint markers you express, the greater amount of HIV in those cells. So this could be really important, not only just for boosting T cell function, but eliminating HIV persistence. There are other ways that you can boost T cell function. Um, this um, approach uses IL-15, or a super agonist called AL2803. Um, this is work done by Brad Jones in vitro and ex vivo. And what Brad did here was he took resting T cells from HIV-infected individuals on ART and measured the frequency of HIV infection. When he added IL-15 super agonist, or ALT803, you can see no change in the frequency of HIV infection. When you add autologous T cells, you see very little change in um, the frequency of HIV infection. But when you add autologous T cells with this IL-15 super agonist, you can eliminate the number of infected cells. Now, ALT803 is currently in phase one, two clinical trials for solid organ malignancy, and is an open label, single arm, dose escalation study being planned in HIV infected individuals on antiretroviral therapy by Tim Shacker. Finally, there's a really strong relationship between immune activation and viral persistence. This just shows you some data attained from tissue looking at the relationship of HIV persistence in rectum and lymph node with the frequency of activated CD8 T cells. And there's been many other studies looking at a whole range of other markers of immune activation. So whether interfering with inflammation will ultimately reduce HIV persistence is also an area of active investigation. Finally, I just want to say a few words about measuring the HIV reservoir. We don't have a perfect way to measure the reservoir. This um, schematic summarises all the different assays that we currently use. GAG DNA most commonly used, which 
dramatically overestimates the reservoir when you just look at replication competent virus. We also know there's only a subset of, of, of the um, virus that persists that actually has what we call intact genomes. So a virus that has a sequence that's capable of replicating. So better and simpler tests to measure intact genomes as well as replication competent virus. So really high priorities. This can be done, but these are difficult, complex assays. There's a need for other assays that can measure and can, could actually specifically detect an infected cell. And this is work that we've been doing to use flow cytometry and probes for HIV RNA to detect an infected cell. And this just shows you the um, development of this assay using uninfected cells mixed with activated or HIV expressing cells in a one-to-one -one ratio. And then using these RNA probes to detect GAG or envelope um, in, uh, by flow cytometry. You could also use um, uh, immunohistochemistry to actually detect those, or light microscopy to detect those infected cells. And we can detect this, those cells down to quite low frequency, at least with these um, uh, cell lines down to about one in 100,000 cells. And this would be a fantastic tool because you could actually sort out the HIV infected cell and then either study that cell or measure it more accurately. Total body imaging may also play a role, not yet done uh, or, or developed fully for humans, but this is results using SIV infection and a uh, copper-labelled antibody to SIV GP120 and then CT PET scanning of a monkey infected with SIV on antiretroviral therapy. And you can get a sense um, of where the virus persists, at least in this um, study it was largely in the, in the gastrointestinal tract and in the nasal mucosa. Mm. Finally, the holy grail is finding a biomarker that can predict cure or remission. Specifically, time, if we could delay time to rebound, a biomarker measured on antiretroviral therapy that could predict the time to remission, to time to rebound, or alternatively predict a lowered set point. And a lot of people very interested in this. Um, HIV DNA measured at the time of treatment interruption in a range of cohorts does correlate to time to viral rebound. Cell associated RNA has also been shown to correlate. And then very interestingly, PD1 expression or how intact your immune fighting cells are on CD4 and CD8 T cells prior to antiretroviral therapy was known to be associated with um, time to rebound. This is an area that we really need to develop because it's going to be critical for future clinical trials to be performed in the absence of a treatment interruption. So just in conclusion, there are multiple barriers to eliminating HIV, including both HIV persistence but also ongoing impaired immunity. Um, agents that reverse latency still need to be more potent, uh, more specific, and also induce death of the infected cell. And it's almost certain that alternative approaches will be needed to target different tissue reservoirs. Uh, Long-term immune control is something we really need to worry about um, because once someone stops treatment, any persistent virus needs to be contained and there may be a role for immune checkpoint um, blockers. And new modalities are needed to quantify the frequency and location of infected cells and specifically ones that predict time to remission. I just wanted to thank um, a lot of uh, people who contributed data to the presentation, um, and particularly Jeff Lipson and Guido Silvestri, who provided some of their slides. Um, all of the funders that support a range of studies that um, we do in my own laboratory in Melbourne. And finally, just for those of you that want some very simple information about HIV cure for your patients, I want to draw your attention to a new website that was in established in a, in a partnership between scientists and community in Australia, hivcure.com.au. It's hosted by the National Association of People Living with HIV. It's written entirely for patients with an update on advances in, in clinical research, advances in clinical trials, and some of you might find that useful as well. Thanks very much.